Well, let me start by uh, trying to give you my interpretation of the Eurozone debt crisis. And uh, I think to really appreciate what is going on here, I think we have to put it into a, a larger context. Uh, in my view, the Euro debt crisis is simply a, a facet of the larger global financial crisis that started in 2007. It is sort of the European version of the global financial crisis, or it's the sort of most recent incarnation. Um, the crisis that started in 2007 is far from over. It's, it's, uh, nothing has been resolved. I think this crisis is uh, uh, still in full flow, and it will go on for a much longer time. Um, just to illustrate this point, I mean, just yesterday, the US Federal Reserve came out after two days of deliberations about policy, and uh, their message was that they are likely to keep interest rates at 0% way into 2014. And as we all know, uh, in this country, the Bank of England is very close to conducting another round of quantitative easing. Uh, and it's not that the previous two rounds have been such roaring successes. Um, so uh, wh why are central banks doing this? I mean, why are they keeping you know, interest rates at 0% for an extended period of time? And the answer is quite simply because their banking systems need it. You know, the banking systems are still <coughs> uh, Banks are hugely overstretched and overlevered. And without an, a massive policy support, uh, we would have a period of immense credit contraction globally. Uh, so in a way, I see many of the, 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 the problems here very much connected. Uh, what happened in 2007 is that a multi-decade credit expansion, and in a way probably the largest credit expansion in, in history, has come to an end. And since 2007, the market is increasingly questioning the uh, sustainability of the very large levels of debt that have been accumulated globally. I mean, this, this debt is completely out of line with underlying voluntary savings. Uh, it's out of line with the propensity of the public to save. Uh, it's out of line with uh, um, you know, the real underlying income streams. Um, the, uh, these debt levels are the result of, of a massive decade-long credit expansion that we all enjoyed. Uh, but the market is no longer funding this. So the problems that we have globally are you know, pretty much the same. You know, excess levels of debt, weak and overextended banks. You know, most of this debt is obviously on bank balance sheets. And distorted asset markets. So what does the market do when it perceives there's too much debt? Well, it wants to liquidate it. it the market, if left to its own devices, would you know, exit the weak borrowers. Uh, we would see defaults, we would see debt deflation, we would see credit contraction. Uh, yes, that would involve a recession, there's no question, probably a very severe one. But the market would ultimately bring the system back to some form of balance. Uh, and the story of the last four or five years has simply been that policymakers are trying to fight this tooth and nail. And this is what we're seeing in the US, this is what we're seeing in this country, and this is what we're seeing in the Eurozone. How have policymakers tried to do this? Well, the first step initially was to simply accumulate a lot of the private debt and put it on the government's balance sheet and have the taxpayer pay for this. Uh, and the second pillar of the strategy has been to have the central banks print practically unlimited amounts of bank reserves and provide them to the banking sector to uh, avoid bank failures and a, and a contraction of the, of the banking system. Uh, and a part of that strategy has also been an attempt to monetize debt, and now increasingly to use the central banks to, uh, uh, to fund the governments almost directly uh, via quantitative easing and other debt monetization. So the first question is, how could we get into such a mess? I mean, this is like a massive global problem of, of gigantic proportions, and as I said before, none of this is solved. I mean, what, it, it may be the case that the crisis is sort of uh, simmering under the surface in countries like Britain or the United States, uh, and all the attention is now on the Eurozone for obvious reasons, uh, but none of the problems in the US or Britain have been solved, and, and neither have they in Japan, where, you know, we, uh, that country is sitting on a gigantic powder keg for, 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 for a decade, for two decades already. So how did we get into this mess? Now, the short answer is because Richard Nixon closed the gold window on August 15, 1971. Um, uh, in the 20th century, we've seen a continuous movement away 
from constraining finance in form of a gold standard or commodity-based monetary system and moving to a system of complete unlimited fiat money production. Uh, this is something that already started you know, obviously in the First World War when many countries you know, abandoned uh, the classical gold standard to fund the war effort. After the Second World War, we had Bretton Woods, which was practically a system to institutionalize global inflationism uh, at the time in a somewhat controlled manner. Uh, and since 1971, we have a system of entirely unconstrained money production. Uh, around the world, money is uh, fiat money. It can be created by the local central banks without limit. Uh, and uh, without any restrictions and no cost. Since 1971, the two oldest currencies in the world, the US dollar and the pound, uh, have had the, uh, most, uh, the largest inflation they ever had in their two to 300 year history. Uh, they had previously been off gold or silver, but never had they experienced the inflation we had since 1971. Uh, and for those who believe that you know, we had not inflation for the last you know, 10 or 20 years because consumer prices have uh, not risen that much. Obviously, most of that inflation has then been channeled into asset markets, in particular real estate, bonds, equities. Um, I think you know Andrew and Brandon already described the habit of governments to bail out their banks. Uh, now, this has obviously been uh, possible since the uh, since the introduction of fiat money uh, on an unlimited scale. You know, in a fiat money system, the central bank can provide bank reserves without limit. Uh, and therefore, in such a system, it's usually deemed that banks cannot go under, or at least the banking system as overall will never shrink. Uh, so the two beneficiaries of such a system are obviously the state and the banks, and the two of them are very closely linked together. Uh, and it's not surprising that since 1971, we've seen a massive uh, growth in public debt around the world, a massive expansion in the banking sector, uh, and uh, I would even argue, you know, today's hot political topic of, you know, bank bonuses and high pay in, in, in banks is obviously a, a, a natural outcome of a system in which, you know, uh, risk taking and bank balance sheet expansion and credit uh, expansion are systematically subsidized and the costs are being socialized via inflation and other means uh, through the state. So this system has brought us uh, high inflation, unprecedented credit expansion, rise of financial leverage, um, and an, an unprecedented debt accumulation. And obviously, in the later phase of this expansion, debt was mainly accumulated uh, in the public sector. Now, such a system can look stable for a very long time. Um, because whenever the credit boom peters out and is about to go into a credit contraction, the central bank can come in, lower interest rates, provide more money, and you know, give the system another boost. And so the recession is shortened. The recession is not allowed to uh, contract credit. It's not allowed to reduce leverage in the banking system. The recession is not um, allowed to cleanse the system of any misallocations from the previous boom but more money is being put into the system, interest rates are lowered, the recession is managed, and we go into another credit expansion. And that has pretty much worked um, you know, for 40 years. I mean, not everywhere. Uh, obviously, in Japan, that process ended much earlier. But uh, I would say in the rest of the world, you know, this process has come to an end in 2007. There must be an end game in this process. Ultimately, the private sector will no longer participate in this. Private balance sheets will be too overextended. And, and the private sector will not participate in further, further leveraging of the system. And I think that per point was finally reached in 2007. So from my point of view, we are facing a much larger crisis than uh, the Eurozone debt crisis. We are facing a fiat money crisis. Yeah. I think our fiat money system has finally reached its end game. Um, the, uh, I think... It, this, 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 the next couple of years, or the next five or ten years, I don't know how long it will take, could be marked the, sort of the, the, the twilight of the fiat money era. Um, this system has been taken to its most extreme point, and uh, I don't see you know, any easy way out of this problem. So I think that the, the question whether Greece will default or exit the Eurozone are probably minor questions in the larger scheme, uh, scheme of things. Uh, so what, is, what could we do or what could we expect? You know, at such a point, 
Now, first of all, I, I, I think that the, the policy we're seeing right now, most of the policy initiative, um, is simply an attempt to continue to do what we've done for the last 40 years. You know? And this is why so many people uh, almost get angry you know, when, you, when, we, when we talk about these, 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 these policy problems, because often the response is, this, this is easy. You know, just, just lower interest rates, print more money, you know, fiscal spending. You know, it has worked for 40 years, but now debt levels have reached su such a level that it will be ever more difficult you know, to push the system further out. Most of the central banks are at zero interest rates. Uh, all central banks have pretty much you know, doubled to tripled their balance sheets over the last three or four years. And all these central banks are desperately trying to do more of the same. Uh, but I don't think it will be possible to, to, to expand this process ever further. When Ludwig von Mises, uh, the great Austrian school economist, said that um, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis comes further, it uh, comes earlier, sorry, it comes earlier as a result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit creation, or the crisis comes later as part of a total collapse of the currency system involved. So either you voluntarily stop at some point printing money, allow the market to liquidate what the market deems to be unsustainable, go through a tough credit contraction that will involve bank failures and other unpleasant things, uh, but allow the system to come back into balance. Or you do not do this, you try to print ever more money, but then you need to do that ever faster and ever more aggressively to get the system to expand further. Uh, and then ultimately you will undermine the trust in the currency. And once people disengage from your currency, money becomes a hot potato, inflation shoots up, and you have a currency crisis on your hands. So it's either of these two, two uh, outcomes. So what would I recommend? I mean, it's, I'm not quite sure if I could call this monetary reform because it's, yeah, it sounds more like a root canal treatment. Um, I, think, I think ultimately we've got no choice. I think ultimately we have to make a where we stop printing money, where we allow the market to set interest rates according to truly available savings, which are much smaller than what the credit edifice uh, you know, pretends or projects. Uh, we have to allow market to set interest rates and risk premiums, which will then be higher, and the market will liquidate what the market deems to be um, uh, not sustainable. Um, then ultimately, I think, once that process has uh, concluded, you know, we need to go back to a system of apolitical and hard money, and not a system of fully elastic money or fiat money. I think we will ultimately have to go to some form of commodity money, and I think you know, a proper you know, gold standard would be, would be ideal. Now, please, don't, I don't think that this is very likely to happen anytime soon in the sense that I don't see any political party, uh, or maybe with the exception of Ron Paul in America, uh, I don't see any political party uh, arguing for this. Um, uh, uh, this would certainly you know, undermine the modern you know, welfare state and uh, would, would have you know, great sort of social and political implications. Uh, so I don't think anybody in politics is arguing for that policy, and that's why I think my outlook is much more that we will see more of the same, more desperate money injection, more quantitative easing. Ultimately, this will, this will be seconded by other interventionist measures like um, uh, capital controls uh, or other you know, heavy-handed interventions in capital allocation. Now, uh, but let me say again, what, what should happen here, really? I mean, I think, first of all, I think, so we should start printing money. I think that's, that's the first thing. Um, I do think that sovereign default uh, is something that should happen not only in Greece, but also in other countries. And uh, to be very honest, I think that that is actually an opportunity. Um, I do think that uh, the whole talk about government bonds and saving these sovereigns um, is, is hugely misplaced. From my point of view, uh, we have to remember that government bonds do not represent productive capital. Um, so I do think a default would be send a very important message uh, that sort of savings should be channeled into productive uses and not being ever more uh, drawn towards funding you know, government consumption. See, the po first important point we have to realize about government bonds is that they do not represent productive capital. By issuing government bonds, the government practically taps into the available pool of savings, does not allow those savings to be invested in, 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 
productive uses. And as we all know, most of what the government does is consumption. Most of the money will be spent in the present period. Uh, and when, once the money is spent, the government can only repay its loans by taxing the productive part of society. So those people who buy government bonds practically accept that the money they give to the government is not put to productive uses, but that they will be paid out of productive uses by the government taxing other parts of the economy. So there is something inherently parasitic about government bonds. And it's very clear that we could imagine a free market society in which all saving was invested in uh, government, uh, corporate bonds and in equities, but we cannot imagine a society in which all savings are invested in government bonds. Um, secondly, I think we should also be very clear that you know, government bonds, the idea that the entire population ultimately needs to pay for the excessive borrowing of previous governments in its country uh, is something that we're just simply not going to work. Uh, I don't think people feel personally responsible for the government, that, for the money that, for the uh, debt that their government has taken on. Uh, most people feel they are is completely outside of their control how much their government will borrow. Uh, just simply, you know, every four or five years being involved in the voting process does not mean you really feel personally responsible for how much your your, your government borrowed. And ultimately, people will not repay this. And the idea that you know, future generations will work very hard to repay the debt that previous generations accumulated is, uh, is pretty much nonsense. So these kind of debt levels will simply not be repaid. Uh, and I think the, so the sooner, I think this idea takes hold that government bonds are not safe, that they're not a safe asset, and that they do not, that, that you know, large pension fund allocations or insurance you know, money should not be allocated to government bonds. I think the sooner that realization sinks in, I think the better. So in my view, the, uh, the, the shrinking of the banking industry and ultimately the, uh, the defaults of government securities uh, will ultimately send in a very important message to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the market. Uh, I, I was, do I have one more minute? For no, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, okay, very uh, so I think, I think countries like Greece and I think over time others should default. I do not think that that necessarily means exiting the Eurozone. So I do think you can default without exit. I th I'm not quite sure why the idea has taken hold that you know, once a government has defaulted, it has to leave the euro area. You know, the, uh, the euro is paper money, and paper money is not backed by the credit of the government. You, know, the, the, you cannot take your, your paper pounds and, and buy anything directly by the Bank of England for it, as you used to do when it was backed by gold. Uh, the value that money has simply comes from its acceptance in exchange with you know, other citizens. As long as money is accepted uh, as a medium of exchange, um, uh, uh, there is no reason you know, why that should be changing if the government is, is, is ultimately bankrupt. The risk to the money is simply over issuance, which is if the government wants to avoid bankruptcy and print, has its central bank print money to stay in business or to save its banks, then you have the problem of over issuance and then there is a problem with the money. I do not see why a country like Greece, after having defaulted, or Italy, or Spain, or wherever, uh, would have to leave a currency union, certainly under gold standard conditions, that would have not been the case. Um, I think at this time, I conclude yeah. my remarks. No, no, thank you. Thanks.